Hey everyone, a little delay there, sorry about that. It's Brian Barron with you for this week's Paula's Choice live chat. I'm the director of skincare research at Paula's Choice and I am on this channel pretty much every week. Um, and uh, just to, we, we have different skincare topics we discuss. Um, we share questions and information with each other. Um, I always find it fascinating to hear what you guys think and what you want to know. And uh, today's topic uh, to get the show started is going to be toners, what they do in a skincare routine, why they're important. Uh, we can talk about specific Paula's Choice toners. We have several, probably more than um, any other brand you can think of. Uh, yeah, even Clinique, and, and they don't really position theirs as toners so much. So, uh, but before we dive into toners, uh, and let me know just, Pepper your questions on the side there and, and we'll get to those. Let's try to do the toner questions first and then other skincare questions later. Um, I keep forgetting to tell you guys every single week uh, that I have an Instagram. Um, I don't post a ton, um, but it's there if you if you want to check it out and, and follow me. I try to keep it interesting. It's kind of a mix of like some skincare stuff, products I like, um, Personal pictures, like pictures of my adorable four-year-old son, um, who's getting so big uh, and even more adorable. I'm so blessed. Um, but it's Brian J. Barron, Brian with a Y, all together, B-A-R-R-O-N. Um, that's my handle at Instagram, so check it out. The other thing I wanted to mention, <clears throat> and I'm going to be doing a little bit of reading here from a study I came across and let me pop back up to the top. It is from the Journal of Cell Communication and Signaling, and it was uh, published online in um, February of 2018. So certainly counts as, as a newer study. And the title is Extracellular Matrix Regulation of Fibroblast Function, Redefining Our Perspective on Skin Aging. The, the part that I'm going to read to you is what I found most fascinating, but the entire study uh, is just really, really interesting if you want to geek out over it. Um, it is available, in fact, here, if you guys, I can share this with you right in the chat. Um, this is an open access study. Study I am discussing. Boop. Okay, so don't click away from the show now, though, because we have a lot to discuss. You can check it out later. Um, let me get back to that, though, so I can read you the part that I found really fascinating. Uh, for those of you who do not know, the extracellular matrix is the component of skin where all of the um, connective tissue essentially uh, lives. The, your collagen, your elastin, it's kind of that, uh, it's sometimes referred to as the dermal epidermal junction where the lower layers of skin end and the that section right before the dermis starts, which is the lower layer of skin, and then you get into uh, the subcutaneous fat layer, and then you've got bone. <laughs> um, but and, Oh, and fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are specialized cells that make collagen, and uh, they can also generate what's called tropoelastin, which is the precursor to the type of elastin that we want in our skin. So... <clears throat> This is the fascinating part, and there's going to be some, uh, I guess you'd say, 50 cent words here. Uh, if you don't know what they mean, um, I, I often have to look up a lot of these words, but just bear with me. So, the phenotypic cellular and biochemical alterations linked to fragmentation and disorganization of the dermal ECM, extracellular matrix, may have repercussions well beyond those of cosmetic alterations to the skin, i.e. wrinkles and sagging. For example, age-associated degradation of dermal cross-linked collagen and elastin manifests in the skin as fragility and reduced capacity for wound healing. Stability of the extracellular matrix modulates the availability of many bioactive molecules bound within, as cross-linked collagen molecules are fragmented, you don't want them to be fragmented, but they can become that way, um, uh, mostly due to sun damage, but there's other factors at play. But as these molecules are fragmented, larger quantities of pro-inflammatory mediators may be released. In addition, 
loss of contact with the dermal ECM due to its fragmentation induces production of pro-inflammatory mediators and MMPs, which are matrix metalloproteinases, those are enzymes, they're destructive enzymes, uh, by the fibroblasts. So the very cells that should be making healthy collagen and helping to make or repair elastin are instead secreting an overabundance of these inflammatory collagen degrading enzymes. Not good. This self-perpetuating cycle produces increasingly larger quantities of bioactive molecules that upon breakdown of the extracellular matrix have the ability to enter circulation and transport through the body. Uh, given that the surface area of skin is the largest of any organ in humans, potential serum transport, serum in this case meaning the blood, of these bioactive molecules raises the intriguing possibility that deleterious age-related alterations in the dermal extracellular matrix may contribute to systemic aging. Indeed, a recent report provides evidence in support of a role of age-related decline of skin barrier function in systemic aging in mice. Uh, just So the big takeaway there uh, that, that I wasn't aware of myself was that this collagen and elastin damage and degradation that happens in the lower layer of skin, uh, that, that the byproduct of that and the inflammation that results isn't localized. It doesn't just stay within the skin uh, and then manifest itself on the surface. It can actually go throughout the body causing other types of systemic breakdown that can lead to further signs of aging. Um, they didn't necessarily elucidate in the study what those further signs were, um, but, but you know, you can imagine, you know, just think of somebody who is in their 80s, if you know someone, and look at what they are dealing with health-wise or maybe complain about, this hurts, that hurts, it's not as easy for me to do this anymore. <laughs> I certainly am getting to that stage in my mid-40s, um, you know, especially trying to keep up with a little four-year-old, but yeah, that isn't that fascinating. And and um, it isn't hopeless. There are things you can do. Number one being practice daily broad-spectrum sun protection. Use a retinol. Uh, if your skin can't tolerate retinol, there are alternatives to retinol you can consider. Um, I know recently we talked about Bakuchiol, which is kind of the up-and-comer. It is not an apples-to-apples -apples equivalent to. Uh, retinol, but it does many of the same things in terms of reducing signs of aging, discolorations, texture issues, uh, and it seems to be generally, from, from what the research has shown so far, Bakuchiol does seem to have greater tolerability than retinol. But that is not to say, because I know it's, it gets written about a lot, that's not to say that retinol is a problem for everybody. Let me grab my water here. New flavor today, it's mango. I'm changing fruits. <laughs> Some of you may recall I, I had a fondness for the blackberry flavor, and I still do. It's quite good. Um, so let's get into toners. Let's talk toners. Tony, Tony, Tony. Feels good. Um, anyone remember that song? Am I totally dating myself there? But so this is one of my favorite toners. This is like my, uh, I call it my ride or die skincare product, the Advanced Replenishing Toner from Resist. I was not a regular user of toners prior to working for Paula's Choice. And even when I first started with the line, and at that time we only had two toners. We had a final touch toner for normal to oily skin, and we had final touch toner for normal to dry skin. And they were definitely much more basic than the toners we offer now. But even back then, um, this was this was in 2000, um, geez. Wow. Uh, even back then, uh, Paula's toners were, were still pretty darn state-of-the-art compared to what was out there. So let's start really quick by just explaining what toners do. Um, it's, it's a bit of a misnamed product, but it's one of those names that uh, has stuck. Uh, and people sometimes will call them um, waters or essences or sometimes elixirs. Those are all synonyms for toners. But the thing is, in terms of why it's kind of an odd name, is that a toner doesn't really tone anything. You know, it doesn't like firm up, so to speak. It doesn't tone like, you know, you're toning your muscles. Um, and it also, where's it going? Oh, 
toners typically have little to nothing to do with one skin tone. There can be skin tone improving ingredients in toners, but the purpose of using a toner uh, is to give back to skin what is taken away by even the most gentle cleansers during the cleansing process. Toners can also help remove any last traces of makeup or sunscreen that you may have missed while you were doing your cleansing. Um, for some people, particularly those with oily or breakout prone skin, a well-formulated toner can be your hydrator. In other words, Using a well-formulated toner, you don't necessarily have to follow with a moisturizer at night, particularly if you are somebody who finds that no matter what type of moisturizer you use, a thin lotion, a gel, a serum type texture, if it seems like anything like that always ends up breaking you out or always ends up making your oily skin feel greasy, not the goal, then a toner could be the perfect solution. Um, what to look for in a toner? You want to look for a toner that is alcohol-free, preferably fragrance-free, and by alcohol-free, just backsliding there for a second, um, I mean a toner that does not contain the drying, irritating types of alcohol, such as SD, which stands for specially denatured, or it's more commonly listed on the ingredient statement as alcohol denate, and put a little period at the end. Uh, that is the bad kind of alcohol. You will often find that ingredient in toners that are labeled astringent and uh, alcohol, especially if there's enough of it in there, as well as witch hazel, which is another ingredient to avoid in toners uh, because it's just too tannic, too astringent, it can be irritating. Ironically though, quick aside, witch hazel does have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, it can be soothing, but there's really no way to get just the benefits from witch hazel without also getting some of the bad stuff. Um, and in order to extract witch hazel from the uh, plant, it's typically, it's, it's, it's a twig essentially, in order to get it out of that stick, the essence, uh, typically alcohol distillation is used and then some of that else, so even though there is an alcohol naturally occurring in witch hazel, it's used to extract it from the plant and that is why uh, it ends up in the product. So alcohol, watch out for that. Witch hazel, watch out for fragrance, which includes essential oils. I have seen more toners or waters than I can count that um, some of them will even advertise as fragrance-free, but they contain fragrant oils. And just like witch hazel has some beneficial properties to it, so do a lot of essential oils. The problem with those is that the fragrant components that make rosemary you know, smell so earthy and that make lavender so floral and kind of minty, those are volatile compounds that can trigger skin irritation uh, either by directly or indirectly because when you put those essential oils on your skin, uh, even if you don't see or feel the irritation taking place, a lot of them auto-oxidize in the presence of UV light. Uh, sorry, in the presence of oxygen. UV light can play somewhat of a role, but it's mostly oxygen. So what happens is you put those volatile fragrant ingredients on your skin and you can't avoid oxygen in the air, at least if you go into an oxygen-free room, <laughs> they do exist. Uh, you, won't, you won't stay in there for long. If you do, you will die. Uh, <laughs> don't want that. So those Ingredients on skin surface, when they're exposed to air, can begin to oxidize, and then that can start a chain reaction of free radical generation that the skin and the other ingredients in your product then have to work overtime to, uh, to quench to the extent possible. Our skin is exposed to enough of those damaging free radicals as it is. Don't do anything that's going to make it worse. Um, I think I pretty much, those are the basics. Menthol. You want to watch out for that uh, as far as avoiding it and, and other forms of menthol like menthol lactate and um, menthoxypropanediol is another one that's a synthetic form of menthol that is even more potent than the pure stuff. Pardon me there. Um, toners should contain ingredients, as I mentioned a moment ago, that give back. You want a toner to be chock full of replenishing ingredients antioxidants. There's no single best antioxidant. There's a range of good ones. Uh, and even better if it also contains skin restoring ingredients, which would include ceramides, uh, to some extent hyaluronic acid, definitely niacinamide, 
retinol, although I, off the top of my head, I can't think of a toner with retinol. I'm sure there's one or two out there. Um, we don't use retinol in our toners because it is one of those ingredients that we feel is better served, used in maybe one, maybe two products, and there are better ways to deliver retinol to skin than in a toner format. But just a quick formulary aside there. And peptides. Seeing peptides in toners is also a good thing. So we have, how many toners do we have? I think we have, I think Paula's Choice actually has eight or nine toners right now. I use the Resist Advanced Replenishing Toner. That is for normal to dry skin. I'm more combination skin, but I, um, I love this product because of its milky texture. It's super soothing. It has a who's who of antioxidants in it. Um, I use it uh, every morning and night, and I love it in the morning after I shave. I don't use an aftershave as far as a product specifically labeled that. I use my toner. So we have one, uh, eight. I'm counting our toners here. We have nine. I was right. Nine. I said eight or nine. Nine toners. Uh, one in each of our collections, except for defense. Um, there isn't a defense toner in the works. I don't know if there will be or not. We were aiming to keep that line a little bit more uh, streamlined uh, because defenses ultimately are kind of our introductory skincare line for people that have normal skin and may be concerned about um, first signs of aging or age prevention. Uh, and then of course, what does defense mean? It's pollution defense and that is something that everybody is exposed to. So it's one of those broad reaching benefits that you can benefit from <laughs> uh, regardless of how old you are when you start using defense. So, all right, let's dive in and see if we have some toner questions here. Um, oh, when is toner applied? It's just applied after cleansing, and then you can move on to your exfoliant, your serum, treatment products, moisturizer, eye cream during the day, sunscreen's the last item you apply. Mm. Okay, uh, MDW says, what two or three toners have the highest amount of niacinamide? I currently don't use a toner and wondering what they do for skin. Well, hopefully what I mentioned earlier, MD, answered the latter part of your question. Uh, the two toners from Paula's Choice that have the highest amount of niacinamide would be our Skin Balancing Pore Reducing Toner and the Resist Weightless Advanced Repairing Toner. And if memory serves, those have roughly uh, the same amount of niacinamide along with the um, adenosine ingredient, which is uh, another skin restoring ingredient. It kind of helps rev up cellular metabolism. Um, yes. Skin cells do go through metabolic processes. Um, it's not just a marketing term. I know it's often used that way, but there really is, you know, a lot of um, energy uh, going on within the cellular machinery that's responsible for maintaining skin. It's it's shockingly complex, uh, and we're learning more about it all the time. Starvo says hello. When a PC toner calls out certain ingredients, are they in percentages? High enough to replace a moisturizer calling out the same ingredients or a serum for that matter. Um, generally, no. I would say that in terms of potency, the um, if you're looking at a, to a Paula's Choice toner and a moisturizer and a serum that all have the, the same ingredient, let's say niacinamide, um, chances are in most cases, I think the um, serum is going to have the most the highest concentration, separate, well, specific to niacinamide, the highest concentration is going to be our 10% booster, but let's not overcomplicate things. Niacinamide in a serum is going to be at a higher percentage, and then the next level is going to be a moisturizer, and then a toner uh, would be uh, last on the list, but that doesn't mean that you aren't getting enough niacinamide to experience the benefit of that ingredient. That one of the hallmarks of every Paula's Choice toner is that they are, they're all gentle, they're all fragrance-free, they are water-based formulas, they're meant to feel lightly hydrating and soothing, and every plant extract, every antioxidant, peptide, ceramide, is used either as part of a blend or singly in an amount that research has shown is going to produce a measurable benefit on skin. So <clears throat> I don't want anyone who is using our toners to think that they're missing out on something by not using some of the other products. I mean, that's great if you do. It's it's a nice additive benefit. But if you're someone who is using one of our toners as your sole moisturizer and you're loving the results, um, that's fine. If you're curious to add more ingredients without adding any sort of weight 
to break out prone skin, then you'd want to look to one, one or more of our boosters because those are all so sheer, uh, but packed with that, you know, there's typically the one star ingredient, azelaic acid, niacinamide, vitamin C, supported by um, ingredients that enhance or complement the benefit of the called out ingredient. Okay, I think I did that one. P50, yay or nay, that's from uh, Jacopo. So that must be the, um, what is it, Biologique Recherche, uh, the P50. Those have all been reviewed on Beautypedia uh, by the team, so you can hop over there um, at, later on uh, and check out our reviews. But um, there's different P50s, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't think we ended up recommending any of them. Uh, they, they all have one or more problematic ingredients, um, whether it's phenol in the one that is, um, what is it, P50 from 1970 or P50 Classic, uh, and that, or, or they have um, vinegar, a uh, rather high amount of vinegar, like you take the cap off and there's no mistaking, that's vinegar, uh, which really what you're smelling is called acetic acid, which is the acidic component of vinegar, uh, and it's a potent skin irritant. It can actually denature and kill skin cells. Well, I shouldn't go so far as to say it can kill skin cells like alcohol can, but it can definitely denature them. It can uh, significantly disrupt the skin's barrier without really conveying any benefit. Okay, so I would have to say um, nay. Um, so Spandana is asking, will Paul's Choice come up with a hydrating essence? We had our um, brightening essence, um, and that uh, is kind of... I know some of our markets still have that product, um, and I need to cross-check something real quick here. It has not, just to clarify. It has not officially been discontinued. I think I mistakenly said it was in a previous chat, uh, and I was corrected. I had bad information. I apologize. It is still on our U.S. site. So the Brightening Essence from Paula's Choice is the one that we sell right now, and that offers, um, it does offer the niacinamide with the acetylglucosamine, arbutin. Uh, I believe it's our only product with arbutin. That's an interesting uh, skin brightening ingredient. Um, if you are struggling with um, post acne marks, uh, uneven skin tone, uh, there's some other supporting ingredients in there as well, including a couple of peptides. It's a nice formula, actually. Uh, so, yes, Brightening Essence would be one to check out. It isn't a toner consistency, uh, it's a, but it's a very thin, fluid consistency. It has a little bit, um, a little bit of a gel like nature to it, but it doesn't. When you dispense it, it kind of just, it's, it doesn't have that gelatinous thickness to it. Uh, but I could see somebody uh, describing it as a thin gel. Okay, uh, Sophie says, my skin got worse since I used BHA. Is that normal? Uh, generally speaking, no. Uh, but it depends on what you mean by worse. Uh, for example... If after using a BHA exfoliant, you are seeing um, redness, you are seeing you are seeing flaking skin, uh, it's looking dry or feeling dehydrated, uh, that could be a sign that you're either using uh, a BHA that has other irritating ingredients in it. It could mean you're using a BHA exfoliant that's too strong for you. Maybe you jumped up to the two percent where 1% or even half percent would be a better place for you to start. It could also mean that the uh, you're using other, if you're using other products that have bioactive ingredients, it's the combination that is uh, causing what you're seeing on your skin. Um, it's not necessarily the BHA itself, it's how it's interacting with the other products. And in that situation, and that can happen to me sometimes when I'm using too much strong stuff at once, I have to space it out. I either have to use the, um, if I'm using, say, five products in my routine day and night that are um, add-on products and more bioactive, I will um, pick which ones I want to apply in the morning. Uh, for Just as a quick example, um, so my in the daytime, uh, what I've been doing fairly recently is um, apply, underneath my sunscreen, I put on a few drops of our C15 Super Booster and then I follow with the Earth Sourced 
Powerberry Serum. And sometimes, uh, depending on how my skin is doing that day, I will layer our Calm Redness Relief Repairing Serum on top of that because they're all super thin. So you can layer without, you know, again, combination skin here, without it feeling slick or heavy. And then I finish with my sunscreen. At night, I wouldn't put on the C15 and then follow with like the 1% retinol treatment or the 1% retinol booster or the 10% azelaic acid booster. And that is that is just my um, my personal um, front that I'm speaking from personal experience. It isn't bad to layer several products like that. It really depends on how your skin responds. And in my case, I need to separate that. So that could be what's going on too. Okay, this is turning into a longer answer, but this is kind of a fascinating question. Hmm. The other thing that could be going on is what some people refer to as purging. Uh, or they'll, or they'll, they'll start using a BHA exfoliant and they'll, uh, if it's one of ours, they may contact us and say, hey, does my skin have to get worse before it gets better? Uh, you know, is this just something I have to um, wait, you know, kind of just power through? And that can depend. Um, for certain, the, the, there's, there's different schools of thought on the purging reaction to using a BHA exfoliant. If what you are seeing uh, is a fresh crop of clogged pores, maybe you're seeing more blackheads, maybe you're seeing um, more flush colored bumps. Um, what else would it be? I mean, the, open comedones, which would be blackheads, and the closed comedones, which would be the whiteheads. Not necessarily milia, but just those those flesh-colored bumps. If you're seeing a bunch of those on skin surface uh, in short order after using a BHA exfoliant, that could be um, a purge in essence. And essentially what happens is because BHA, as it penetrates the pore lining, it doesn't just exfoliate the buildup of dead skin cells and help them move more freely to the surface where they can shed like they normally would. It also thins the oil that thickens in deeper in the pore, mixes with dead skin cells and tiny debris, like tiny follicular hairs. Um, these are like super tiny hairs. Like, you know, if you literally could pull them out of the pore, you would need a microscope to see the hairs themselves. But they can contribute to a clog. So as the BHA thins the oil, it allow, and then is exfoliating the dead skin cells and the pore lining, you can see how that thicker clog that was kind of stuck further in the skin, uh, now that the oil is less sticky and that there's fewer dead skin cells in the way, uh, keeping it from moving toward the surface, it kind of just goes towards the surface. And for some people, that can result in a fresh new crop of breakouts. Where what purging is not is acne. So if you start using a new BHA exfoliant and you wake up, you know, morning three or morning two, and you are seeing red, uh, red to pink uh, or raised like acne pustules and pimples on your skin, that is not purging. That's acne. Um, BHA is not known to trigger acne. It is well known at helping acne. So in that situation, it, in most cases, the likely reason uh, for that acne breakout is that it's something that would have happened anyway. Uh, maybe uh, if you're a woman, maybe you started using the BHA uh, concurrently with the beginning of your cycle and you normally have a fresh crop of breakouts when that happens, uh, but it, you may not put two and two together and, and you know, as far as the timing of that. Um, and it's always, you know, if the BHA is the new product you used, it's easy to look at that and say, aha, it's your fault. Uh, and there are some situations where if you are allergic to salicylic acid or if it's just too irritating for your skin, you can experience what's called, and this is closing out the topic, I promise, you can experience what's called irritant contact dermatitis. And what's confusing about that is that that reaction can resemble acne. Uh, the difference is that an irritant contact dermatitis typically doesn't respond well, if at all, to anti-acne products. You need to be using soothing um, anti-inflammatory type products, typically like an over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream or a prescription steroid type product to get your skin back to normal. It will return to normal uh, within a matter of days as long as you, uh, if you identify that's what's going on and you stop 
using the offending product, then your skin will return to normal. Um, so I hope I've given you <laughs> probably way too much insight there, but hopefully everyone listening found a, a little bit of that interesting, but we will move on. How are we doing on time? Good, half an hour, okay. Okay, Marcus, hi Brian, greetings from the UK. What are some of your favorite K-Beauty toners essences if you have any? I'm sorry, Marcus, I, I don't, I don't have any. I really haven't, um, I've, I've looked at some uh, various Korean skincare products, various Korean brands, but I've never personally uh, used any of them. I'm um, kind of, I, I'm, I'm aware of what's out there. I will experiment with products from other brands from time to time, but the 99% of what I put on my skin on a daily basis is from Paula's Choice. Uh, either existing products or um, prototypes for other things that we're working on that may or may not uh, come to market. Do not ask me what those are. I can't tell you. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I know that there are some good ones out there. Um, some Korean brands are better than others, or K-Beauty if you prefer. Some of them are better than others at eliminating fragrance, um, which is always to your skin's benefit if you choose minimally fragranced or preferably fragrance free. Um, the essences and, uh, did you ask, did you say essences and toners? Yeah. Beauty toners. Yeah. Um, one of the, th one of the things that I think is kind of fascinating in a way about some of the essences and toners from K beauty brands is that they really put a strong emphasis on hydration. Um, and they will, the formulas will often contain one or sometimes two, usually just one, um, novel ingredient that has an interesting hydration story behind it. Whether it's a, a new kind, a newly discovered plant sugar or a certain plant extract or some, you know, something along those lines that is coupled with glycerin and sodium PCA, those kind of workhorse ingredients. Uh, but it offers uh, kind of a unique benefit and a more of a, I guess you'd say more of a differentiating story because the other hallmark of a lot of these K-Beauty brands is they have a ton of products. Like there's not just one or two essences, there's 20. Uh, you know, a whitening essence and an essence for this and an essence for oily skin and an essence on and on and on and on. And then in terms of how they set up their routines, uh, a lot of people will use all of them. Uh, well, maybe not all of them if there's 20, but my point is the average Korean skincare routine, as you may have learned, has many, many more steps um, than what I think is typical for um, a skincare routine in the UK or a skincare routine in the United States or Canada, North America, if you will. Um, and that's neither good or bad. I, I don't think that you need as many steps as... Uh, if you're looking at a K-Beauty routine that's like 15 to 20 steps, you know, that you're literally doing that many steps morning and night, that's overkill. I just think there are no, no two ways about it. Nobody needs that many products on their skin at, at one time. It's, it just ends up, you're, it's, it's overkill or you're, or you're duplicating in more than one place in your routine. For example, if you're using a toner and an essence and a mist and a solution, pick one of those and that's your toner type step. Uh, and then if you want to shake things up and use a different product, you know, use your, use a, a mist in the morning and an essence at night as your toner step. That's how you can kind of expose your skin to more uh, of those interesting formulas without feeling like you're spending half an hour getting through your morning and evening skincare routines. <clears throat> okay, where did we leave off here? Looks like we're up to Joan. I would like to see a pro... pre. Prebiotic, I really need my reading glasses. Prebiotic booster or toner from PC. Greetings from Spain. Hello, hola. Um, thank you for the suggestion, Joan. I, I think that that category um, as an emerging group is is pretty fascinating. It's definitely one that uh, we're keeping an eye on the research. Um, Rob says, hello. Alice says, I know that Paul has mentioned in the past that it's a myth that brushes hold bacteria since P. acne bacteria dies in the air. That's true. It's uh, P. acne bacteria is anaerobic, so it, it uh, propagates and prefers to live um, outside of exposure to, to, to the air, to oxygen. Uh, that's how benzoyl peroxide is so effective at killing acne-causing bacteria because it releases, it can penetrate into the pore 
where that anaerobic P. acnes bacteria, it goes by a different Latin name now that's escaping me. They actually did like replace it. Um, but for our purposes, P. acnes works because we all know what that is, uh, and so do I. <laughs> but benzoyl peroxide works by penetrating into the, the pore to get to where the uh, acne bacteria is hiding, and it releases an extra oxygen molecule, uh, and then the bacteria go, no, no, not me, uh, and, and then they, they leave. Okay, let's see. So Alice... Um, okay, so the I, Alice, back to your Alice Lee, back to your cut. What about beauty blender sponges necessary to microwave? Um, again, so the 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 reason that you don't need to specifically clean your beauty applicators, you do need to clean them every now and then. Don't mistake. Um, but if you're cleaning them a lot or like after every use because you're worried about acne causing bacteria being on them, don't be. Um, because that, if that bacteria is on the surface of your skin, it ain't lasting very long. So any that does get on your beauty blender type sponge isn't going to survive. Uh, if that sponge is exposed to air for, you know, if, which of course it would be, um, the, the bacteria, if any at all, is living and picked up from the surface of your skin, it isn't going to last that long. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that. I would be more concerned <clears throat> about the buildup on sponges and brushes from um, sebum, your skin's oil, uh, from the ingredients in your uh, morning skincare products. Some of those get a little transferred to the bristles. And it's not that that's necessarily bad for your skin. It's really more bad um, for the makeup application because that buildup keeps the tools from working as well as they could. So that's why you should wash your tools maybe once a month um, and certainly more often if you're wearing uh, heavier makeup. Uh, Alice goes on to say, could you share exactly the process of how P. acnes bacteria, okay, I think I did this. In fact, it's going to lead to breakout. Is this bacteria produced within the skin or is the skin contaminated? It is, it is produced within the skin, Alice, and uh, the, the, there are factors happening in skin that can, and this has to do with the microbiome uh, and the, the beneficial, the balance of beneficial organisms and harmful organisms on the skin. So here's what's interesting. This is a good question. P. acnes bacteria is something that is in everybody's skin. It's just a natural part of most people, if not everybody's microbiome. Um, the difference is how your microbiome and the um, flora on and within skin surface layers keeps that in balance. What's interesting is that there are strains of bacteria that make up the microbiome that can be helpful but if the balance of that um, particular strain or strains gets too out of whack, what was once helpful bacteria can become harmful bacteria. And the opposite is true. The harmful bacteria, if, the, if its population gets out of whack, it can start going toward the good side, if you will. Um, and so all of that can, can play a role in the pathogenesis there's a fancy word, of acne. But really what happens in terms of the bacteria is that the P. acnes bacteria proliferates uh, deeper in the pore. There is, um, it, it, what's the best way to explain this? It, as dead skin cells and excess oil build up deeper in the skin, the bacteria use that as a food source. Uh, this can lead to inflammation that basically, and then, then you were on your way toward seeing uh, a red inflamed acne pimple. So there isn't, P. acnes bacteria is not something that you can catch. Um, it's not like if you kiss somebody that has acne, you're going to get acne. Or if you sleep uh, in a bed with somebody that has acne, then you know the bacteria is on the sheets and it's gonna get on you. Uh, it's not like bed bugs uh, or anything like that. It's, it's just, it's really a, a bacterial uh, imbalance um, in skin's natural um, flora that uh, needs to be controlled, and it's that it's that con controlling that bacteria, uh, which to some degree certain probiotics can help with. Uh, although I would never tell somebody to use uh, only a probiotic or prebiotic cream to keep their acne under control. I think what those can do 
uh, is help to play a supporting role in bringing skin's microbiome uh, into balance to the extent possible. Or really, more accurately to say that they can help your skin's microbiome to um, balance itself. Okay, let's see. I'm scrolling, scrolling. Anthony says, which is more niacinamide, the skin balancing toner or the resist oily toner? Anthony, um, I, you may have joined a little late. I, I'm almost certain the niacinamide amounts are equal, um, but if, if one of the two has more, it would be the resist, uh, simply because all of the formulations in the resist line are, um, like compared to, so all of the formulations in the resist are a bit more advanced than skin balancing because skin balancing is primarily a collection that is based around skin type first and the concerns around aging are secondary so skin balancing definitely has anti-aging ingredients in it but in contrast the resist line the light blue line from normal to oily skin <clears throat> was formulated with anti-aging in mind first and skin type second um, not that skin type wasn't a consideration for that collection because it absolutely was I, th I maintain that that's one of the better collections to um and one of the only collections I've seen that is so uh, geared toward reducing the signs of aging uh, that all of us experience to one degree or another, but also respecting the fact that there is a subset of people concerned about signs of aging, but they are also still concerned with oily skin, with pore size, and with breakouts. Uh, and so that collection is really for them because the majority of anti-aging um, lines on the market, their textures even if they're great formulas, their textures are primarily geared towards drier skin. And it isn't true that as we age, everyone's skin gets drier. That's not an absolute. It does happen for a lot of people. Um, but for some people, it may not happen until they're well into their 60s. Um, but then if they, what are they supposed to do if they want anti-aging in their 40s and 50s? That's where we help. One of the ways we help, at least. Okay. Uh, hi, Brian. This is from GL Quirk. What is the retinol concentration to be reduced in the EU? Always use the 1% clinical concentration. I'm curious that the EU are planning on banning anything over 0.3%. That is um, a proposed regulation that is pending, and we don't know at this point what is going to happen. So we're just kind of watching and waiting. Um, and for now, uh, the 1% um, retinol products from Paula's Choice um, are available in that market. So you can still buy them as usual. Why am I seeing? Hmm. There's like a little blurby right there and I'm not scrolling. Hmm. Okay, got it to work. Minor blip. Let's hop down. Um, let's hop down to the bottom so I can get some of these <clears throat> later questions as we wind down. Still have time. Don't worry. I think I can get to all these questions. Um, Marlo asks my or says my routine consists of roughly 17 to 19 different products day and night, but none of them are from Korea. PC all the way. I'm high functioning Paula. <laughs> now, if you're using 17 Paula's Choice products all at once, um, I. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not uh, uh, degrading our products at all, but that's too many all at once. You just you just don't need if if but if it makes you happy, if you're seeing results, you know, keep doing it. But do you really really need to do that? No. But if you're talking 17 Paula's Choice products and maybe nine of those get used in the morning and then eight or nine of them get used at night, that's a different story. That's 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 me. <laughs> um, and and I and a lot of people that work at the company. Uh, and, and we don't think that that's too unusual. It really depends on the needs of your skin type and your skin concerns. I just don't want to see people um, spending more money than they have to, you know, on a product that, you know, I've already got this in my routine. Do I also need this? Don't they kind of do the same thing? Um, the other thing that can be interesting about that aspect is, uh, and this is something that, that I do a lot, <clears throat> there are some core staples from Paula's Choice in my skincare routine that I just use day in <coughs> and day out no matter what. And then I have my uh, rotating group of products that I will use um, a few times a week, sometimes less than that, depending on what's going on with my skin. 
It's kind of how I am with our masks. Uh, I'm not a regular face masker. I will mask occasionally, so I like having two or three options uh, around depending on um, what my skin's needs are. I've been known to multi-mask where you'll take, like in my case, being combination skin, I'll take one of our oil absorbing masks and put that on my T-zone, and then I'll take one of our hydrating masks and put that on my cheeks and go watch an episode of TV and then go rinse it off <laughs> and finish with the rest of my routine. Okay, Roel says, hi, Brian, when does someone <coughs> need to consider high percentage actives? Personally, I had no wrinkles or extreme, I have no wrinkles or extreme large pores with low levels of niacinamide and the resist ultralight serum and 0.1% retinol be sufficient. Now I'm in my mid thirties. Um, I think, yes, I think as long with what you're experiencing now, I think that's fine. Just keep in mind that skin isn't static and it's, it's skin type can change over time. It can change with the seasons for some people. Uh, and you will likely develop different or more advanced skin concerns as you age compared with what con compared with the level of concerns that you have now. Um, using myself as an example, uh, throughout my 30s, I never used an eye cream. You know, I not only because of what we said about most eye creams, but because I found that my facial moisturizer um, was did and my the combination of that with my serum was just fine around the eyes. Now um, I love using an eye cream. Ours in particular, but there's a lot of good ones out there. I use our Resist anti-aging eye cream, that balm-like one that some people don't like. It's there's a learning curve in terms of applying it. Uh, it's very thick and kind of balm-like, and you got to kind of pat it in. Um, but, uh, and we do have other eye products, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have found that as I go through my 40s, that an eye cream, <clears throat> um, when I, makes a visible difference. When I um, remove it from my routine, I notice a difference and I start missing the results I was getting and before too long, it's back. So I'll occasionally try to revert, you know, back and, and you know, reduce that. I cut it out of my routine and I'm like, oh. I just like it too much. I have to put it back. Okay, Hira or Hira says, Paula's Choice BHA toner is, is love, but how many times do we use it in a week? As I had my skin under the eye very dry, although I don't use it under eye. So depending on which BHA of ours you're using, um, the one or two percent formulas you can use once, maybe even twice daily. If you're noticing that they, that it's causing some dryness under your eyes, um, be careful of applying it in that area. Don't get any closer than like the top of your cheekbone here, because uh, then even even then some of it is going to migrate as it warms to your body temperature. Another thing you could do if you're worried about uh, if you notice that the BHA exfoliant is causing some under eye dryness is that before you put your BHA exfoliant on, put an eye cream or a moisturizer around your eye area first. Let that serve as a sort of buffer or barrier to the BHA if you happen to notice that connection. When you use the BHA, under eye area gets drier. When you don't use it, the eye area isn't so dry. <clears throat> One more swig here. Oh, that's a good question from MDW. Does tinted car windows protect from UV damage? They will, if they, they will protect from UVB even if they're untinted because UVB rays can't penetrate glass. That is why if you are sitting um, in traffic in your car on a sunny day and the sun's coming in and you don't have your windows down, you got the AC cranked, um, you won't get, you could sit there for two, three hours, you know, in midday sun and you will not get sunburned. Um, there are different levels of uh, UVA screening that tinted windows can do, um, but and then some of them just have a universal rating. So the best thing to do in your case um, would be to check the owner's manual for your vehicle if you still have it. And if you don't, um, you could contact uh, the dealer or a local dealer of the, the make and model that you have and, and inquire there. But generally speaking, most of them do. Uh, Eric says, "How does the anti or asks how does the antioxidant content of PC toners compare to PC serums? <clears throat> Do I need to use both? So both our toners and the antioxidant serums contain numerous antioxidants, but the levels of them 
the combined concentration is always going to be higher in the serum. The serums are just made to be more concentrated. That is why, uh, that's why they cost more. That's why the size is smaller. That's why with a serum, a little goes a long way. I go through this bottle of toner um, probably in five or six weeks with twice daily usage. I'm constantly ordering this because I never want to be without it. Um, but yes, the amount of antioxidants in the toner is lower than the serums. So the question of whether or not you need both, it really depends on, on how your skin is doing and what your goals are. If, if you feel like, you know what, I'm mid-20s, I've got pretty normal skin, I am i don't use irritating ingredients, <clears throat> I'm wearing sunscreen every day, I don't have any particular concerns around signs of aging just yet, um, you can get away with using our toner. Use our toner and a good daytime moisturizer and then a good nighttime moisturizer, whether it's from Paula's Choice or another brand, and I think you'll be fine. But then recognize down the road, there will be a time where you'll likely want and will benefit from, and you will see this benefit of using both. Okay, uh, we are getting down to the wire, but not desperate yet. Mac says, whoops, I tuned in late and didn't realize that I had to stick to a toner topic. Sorry. Oh my goodness, you guys. We don't have to be that. We don't have to be that much of a stickler for the rules. I just want to make sure that we get the gist of the live chat conversation discussed in the first 30 minutes so that those people that come back later aren't sitting there for 15 minutes wondering, when is he going to talk about toner? <laughs> so it's fine. Um, but do we have... Any other toner questions? Stormy Mittens asks, can fragrance include active ingredients? I asked a shampoo company why fragrance was listed so high in their ingredient list, and they gave me some rigmarole, I love that word, about the fragrance having active components. <sighs> um, so fragrance has a lot, fragrance is an active ingredient in, in itself and that it is doing something, is creating a volatile reaction that is causing you to say, ooh, that smells good, or ooh, I don't like the smell of that. Um, if the product in question has natural fragrance or natural fragrant ingredients, essential oils, then yeah, I mean, I guess technically they weren't lying because those essential oils do have some bioactive ingredients. They can be, some essential oils are incredible, potent sources of antioxidants. But as I said earlier in the show, you're getting those antioxidants, but you're also getting the bad, uh, more volatile ingredients that are irritating to skin. And confusingly, some of those can be antioxidants as well. Um, our take is that given the number, the vast number of antioxidants that benefit skin and don't have that risk of fragrance uh, or irritation, um, why, why go the fragrant route? Um, you know, use, if you like a nice scent, you know, perfume, perfume your clothes, spray your hair with your favorite bottled fragrance. Uh, hair is dead, you're not gonna irritate it. Just be careful not to spray it directly on your scalp. Spray, get some room fragrance. There's ways, a nice candle. There's ways you can experience fragrance. And, and be, believe me, I totally, there's, there is an experience to fragrances. I mean, I, I have scented candles throughout my house and we light them and it's delightful. Um, but I don't put fragrance on my skin. Okay. Um, th this is that question from Mac that I can't, it says, I can't read the whole question, but it says something like, hi, Brian, my partner has sebaceous hyperplasia. Can you recommend, oh, I said, oh, geez, duh. Can you recommend a Paula's Choice skincare regime that will help him? So sebaceous hyperplasia uh, is when the oil gland basically uh, can start to atrophy uh, and it manifests as um, small to medium sized, um, kind of crater-like flesh colored to yellowish bumps on the skin and uh, they will most often appear uh, in facial areas that have the most oil glands. So we're pretty much talking central part of the face. Doesn't mean you can't get them out in the cheeks if you're oily all over, um, but they're not quite as common there. So skincare wise, there isn't a whole heck of a lot you can do. I know that sounds a bit depressing. I wish it was different. Um, in most cases, 
you need to partner with um, a dermatologist to keep the sebaceous hyperplasia under control. Um, they can take care of them for you in, in an office setting. Uh, and the, the, the good news about that is that they're pretty much gone almost right away. The bad news is that it doesn't mean that the sebaceous hyperplasia won't happen again, either in the same area or in a different area. Uh, it's kind of like acne in that sense. Um, the <clears throat> two ingredients from Paula's Choice that I think could be the most helpful at controlling the visible signs of sebaceous hyperplasia uh, would be our BHA9 and our 10% niacinamide booster. And BHA9 for its keratolytic properties, 9% is a pretty potent amount uh, and that has a controlled release delivery system. It's going to go a bit further into the pore. Uh, it'll help to thin that oil, as I mentioned earlier, which in, in turn should help reduce the size of the bump at least a little bit. And then the niacinamide has a, a as yet to be fully understood role in helping to reshape and normalize the pore lining. So again, that in turn could also impact how the sebaceous hyperplasia bump appears on the skin surface. So those are my top recommendations for products, but my overarching recommendation to anyone dealing with sebaceous hyperplasia is to partner with a dermatologist that can help you keep them under control. Um, and they're not harmful. They're, they can be unsightly uh, in much the same way as other types of blemishes can, uh, and being a more dimensional skin issue, um, they're not really easy to cover up, like with, you know, with concealer. It's kind of like... You know, I've, I've tried to conceal bad pimples before and it kind of just becomes this comedy of errors because everything I do is just making the pimple that much more obvious. The red's gone, but you can tell that there's a big old bump on my skin that I've got, you know, six layers of stuff on trying to hide it. So I just don't even bother anymore. Um, and thankfully, I, I don't break out like that too often anymore either. But yeah, Oy, those days. Okay, um, Kim B is asking if I can address the article on Reddit about skincare companies not using ingredients they're marketing, i.e. ceramide in brand CeraVe. I haven't seen that article, Kim. Um, Kim, if you are still watching and you want to post a link to that in the, I'm assuming it's probably in Reddit skincare addiction forum, um, I'd be curious to check that out. I hadn't it's definitely, I mean, I, I haven't heard anything about that one way or another, but for certain it's disingenuous and, and unethical for a brand to tout a product that, and, and saying it has these ingredients and then upon closer inspection or upon analysis of the formula, oops, they're not there. That's not good, but I'd love to take a look at that. Let's do um, a couple more questions here. Who haven't we taken one from? Togi says, Togi Lee, Ryan, which PC sunscreen is better for dry and acneic skin? Why do I always pick the more challenging questions as we get towards the end? And I'm saying, I thank you for the question. Um, I'm saying it's more challenging because dry skin with acne is the hardest combination to recommend products for. Um, and you're probably like, yeah, I know. It's hard to shop for it too. <laughs> but... Uh, from our line, I would have to say the Skin Restoring Moisturizer from Resist. Um, I think that's going to give you the best blend of moisture, lighter weight ingredients, least likely to clog pores. My second choice, if you want to go the mineral route, would be the Essential Glow Moisturizer from our Defense line. Um, it can be so difficult to really pinpoint what is causing uh, your breakouts or what's making your acne worse, especially if you are using five, six, 10 products in your skincare routine. It may be a specific product or ingredient in the product, or it could be the combination of products. It could be the, I mean, there's just all kinds of variables that are at play, um, which is why the experimentation trial and error is, is needed, but try, Try one or both of those. You can get samples of both and, and see how you do and, and come back and let me know. Okay. 
One more question. Uh, Little, Little Miss Chatterbox. Hi, Brian. Best PC UK products for PIH, which uh, I'm assuming you mean post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Um, ooh, it's a tie. I would say, I, and this is from personal experience, um, when I'm dealing with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which I am right now, uh, a couple of spots. Um, I rely on our C15 Super Booster and the 10% Azelaic Acid Booster. And those are two boosters that I do feel free to layer. I don't notice any issues from layering those, any negative issues, uh, and I see great benefits. So that would be my top pick. If you're thinking, I just wanted one, um, because of its salicylic acid content at 0.5%, I would go with the 10% Azelaic Acid Booster if you just want one. So that wraps it up for the week, everybody. Uh, next week's topic, I think, is either going to be facial sunscreens or facial moisturizers. I'll have a lot to say about either one. So actually, reset, stop, back up. Um, that will be the topic of our next show. Yes. However, um, I am on a vacation next Thursday, so I will not be back live um, on the 3rd. October 3rd. God, October already. But the following October and every other, well, no. <laughs> the last Thursday, I won't be doing a live chat either because I'll be traveling. Um, but we will do as many as, as we can in the month, at least two in October, potentially three. Um, so hang in there with me um, and come back to the page if you wanted to ask additional questions or provide additional feedback. Um, if you guys are liking this, hating this, what do you want to see more of, less of? I'm open to the feedback. You won't hurt my feelings, I promise. So until the next time we're together live, uh, two weeks from today, take care.